Okay, so I start, uh, I start to lose, eh? Okay, so I start to lose. Okay, so very good morning, everyone. I hope all of you are okay. Uh, it's already Friday. Thanks for joining. I hope all of you are ready for a very good weekend. Uh, today, we are already in our third talk uh, out of our four talk series. We are now approaching to a systematic literature review. So I hope uh, all of you have benefited from your previous two talks. I hope all of you have attended. Uh, Pang Wai Ling, can you please mute your mic? Okay. All right. Great. So, um, very good morning, everyone. I hope you guys are okay. So, all of you, as usual, uh, can respond via the chat box. Okay. A bit of housekeeping before we start. Uh, my talks are usually very uh, discussion based. Okay. Uh, so, if all of you have your mic uh, uh, muted, that's good. If any of you never mute your mic, please kindly mute your mic. Uh, Sarah Muni, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining. Okay, so um, let me just um, 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 uh, let me just um, um, uh, recap on what we did in the f in the previous first two talks. Okay, so first one we pro we focus on proposal and thesis uh, development uh, very quickly in two hours. I think we we shared very important uh, points. I shared a lot of templates as well with most of you, uh, and then also. Um, most importantly, we also had a very uh, very important uh, overview of publication. Then the second talk, we focus mostly on high impact publications, how to actually produce publication while you're writing your thesis. And today we are going to look into systematic literature review, which is very important uh, technique uh, these days. Okay. Um, systematic literature review used to, I mean, it was very, very famous in uh, medical clinical area. Okay. Medical research, clinical research, uh, health related research and so on. But not very, uh, not very prevalent, not very famous in the area of social education, technology, engineering, physics, and so on. But however, now it's catching fire. Uh, it's getting a lot of attention from other subject areas. Okay, so we're going to look into it. Uh, very good morning, Intan. Uh, thanks for joining today. So um, today we are going to also focus systematic literature review, mostly for uh, publication, and as well as a bit on thesis as well, how you can use SLR for thesis. Okay, so let me just introduce a, a bit about myself for those who have joined for the first time who don't know me. I am Dr. Tawa. Uh, I have a PhD uh, from Newcastle. I finished mine about two years and 11 months. Never did my master's. I skipped my master's. Um, was that a good idea? I cannot, um, I cannot decide now, but since I've already finished, so it's done deal. Lah, all right. Then I did my postdoc in Birmingham under AIPT, and then I joined industry, a Telecom Malaysia R&D, uh, for about five years. Now, currently, I'm the chief editor and founder of Proofreading by UK PhD. We are the uh, number one academic consulting firm in Malaysia. We are also highly recommended by uh, Elsevi and Taylor and Francis as well. Uh, I'm also an adjunct lecturer with University of Technology Petronas. I've um, accumulated in excess of about U USD 5 million worth of uh, research grants uh, over my uh, uh, research career so far. I have about 60 plus publications. Just last week, I got my another publication in Elsevier Helion. Uh, it's a Q1 journal with impact factor 3.3, I think. I have about three US patents uh, granted and about eight different uh, global standards that have contributed uh, in telecommunication area, policies and uh, technology. I'm also a, I was also a consultant with, for Georgia Tech Industrial Advisory Board in Atlanta. Okay, we were consulting from Telecom Malaysia on the industry perspective. Um, I've uh, so far won over six different awards and I've co completed probably more than seven or eight dozens of invited talks now. I've lost count already. So this is us. Okay, this is the sole reason that I'm here, proofing by UK PhD. We are based at Cyberjaya, our HQ. Uh, but however, we are a digital company. So we, are, we have a digital presence in about 34 different countries. We serve clients in a lot of different regions, especially in South America with the recent uh, penetration in Peru, Chile, and also Mexico. 
and the rest uh, these are all existing uh, penetrations <coughs> we are we are also uh, working uh, we are we have also um, um, accumulated official proof reader status with many universities and also many universities are finishing mou with us uh, with the recent one is uitm finished already um and this is our experience so far uh, the amount of documents that we have completed we have gained a lot of experience from uh, completing over 22,000 documents uh, that includes thesis proposal journal grant documents uh, commercial uh, documents uh, government policies and so on and what do we do we provide a lot of co consultancy and also language uh, language services today's talk we are going to uncover our experience okay unveil our experience that i've gained uh, through thesis consultancy publication uh, thesis to general conversion, all right? And we are also going to discuss a bit on the importance of language as well, all right? So we're going to cover a lot of different areas within a very short time. So to all of you uh, actively participating, you have more than 60 today, which is a good number uh, for UPSI. Uh, I want all of you to be keyboard warriors. That means if you are doing anything else, okay, if you are holding your phone, especially keep that phone away, unless you're watching this from your phone, then that's okay. Uh, if you are in a meeting, doing any other work, writing or whatsoever, keep all of that aside, okay? Give your two hours here, I can assure you that you'll learn a lot today, right? Okay, uh, just to just to ask for from today's audience, uh, how many of you have attended my previous two classes before? And how many of you uh, attended my Facebook live class before? If you never attend, you can just tell you never attend so that I can tell you where to go and find these classes. In the chat box, yeah? Okay, so seems like many first timers. Anyone else first timer? So I can tell you what are my recent classes. Um, okay, all right. Okay, so probably you can also approach uh, uh, Miss Sara in case if she has my recorded classes from the previous two classes. If she has, maybe you can watch that. Okay, you can catch up a lot of uh, knowledge as well. Okay, thank you, uh, No Rosely. Thanks for joining my Facebook classes as well. For those who never joined, don't worry. Just want to see the, the numbers today, the newcomers, so that I can align my talks accordingly. People who are already familiar, I will usually skip a lot of things, but since we have new joiners, I will try to recap as much as I can. Okay, so for those who never joined my Facebook classes before, uh, we have more than 100 and I think what, 13, 115 classes now, free classes. Okay, let me share how to access. Okay, this is um, um, Facebook, all right? So I think most of you know what is Facebook, definitely. Uh, so this is where you need to go and find uh, my Facebook page, okay? Proofreading by a UK PhD. If you don't have a Facebook, it is totally okay. You can just register an account. Don't even need to have a profile photo. Just update your profile a bit. Don't need to give so much information. You don't need to add any friends. You can just keep it to go and learn uh, from all the videos that I've accumulated over, over the years now. Okay, I started since March 2020, since MCO. Until now, I'm still running online classes to teach all my followers as many as I can to share knowledge and uh, to embark into new knowledge as well. Okay, so this is where we usually post a lot of information. Okay, like this was the class I, I, I did last week. Or was it last week? No, I think it was last week. Uh, before, the week before. The week before. All about paraphrasing, how you actually can paraphrase and so on. Uh, and then this one, I just did some fun, fun thing. And we post a lot of important things. Literature review as a research methodology. Um, we do a lot of uh, uh, paper sharing. We do a lot of uh, important uh, notes as well. Okay, like this one, very, very important note and so on. So you guys can go and, uh, and uh, download it if you want to. In case if you want to go to my page immediately now, let me share the link with you. Facebook page. Okay, there you go. So this is my Facebook page link. Okay, I've shared in the chat box already. You can click that and go to my Facebook page right now. Okay, once you arrive there, you can go to more. Uh, you can go to videos. Okay, oh yeah, before that, before that, very important thing. Once you come here, uh, once you arrive here, please go here and click uh, these three dots here, click follow. It's very important because if you don't do that, uh, then you will never you will never know when we post new content or we run when when I go live for Facebook class you won't be notified. Okay, once you click that follow button, 
Again, click the three buttons, uh, the three dots, click the follow settings, and then click favorite. So you'll see post higher in your feed. That means whenever I go live and so on, you'll be notified. So don't forget to do that. Once you have done that, you can go to videos. You can scroll down and then you can see here. Free writing tutorials by Dr. Tawa, 115 videos. All right. So if you click see all, uh, you can see all my latest classes. All about paraphrasing, literature review, reading and summarizing. This is a very, very important class. Okay, literature review, reading and summarizing. Uh, PhD after time with award-winning thesis. Dr. Irfan shared his experience. After six years of PhD, how did he finish his PhD with very minim massively minimal correction? And he also won award from UTN. Okay, so it's a very good experience for you to go and share, for you to go and listen. Literature review, uh, literature matrix design with unique template, concept paper before proposal defense, PhD proposal defense, chapter one template, and so on and so forth. Like this is a very, very hot class. You can see more than uh, more than uh, 3,200 views. Uh, so this one is a very, very important class. You can go and watch if you wish to. And there are many, many different classes here, okay? Uh, finding research gap, PhD daily time planning, research objectives on problem statement. We have four different problem statement classes, chapter on background writing, chapter on introduction writing, and so on and so forth. Okay, so if any of you are facing um, a problem with problem statement, then you can go and watch all these classes. And there are many research methods, qualitative, quantitative, how to calculate sample size, uh, theory, theoretical framework, conceptual framework, and so on and so forth. Right? <laughs> Uh, Chan, can you mute your mic, please, Chan? Okay, thank you. All right, so that is that. Don't forget to click these three dots and then hit the follow button. All right, so uh, not only that, very important is uh, very important is our social media. Okay, our, especially my Telegram group is very, very, very important because. This is where you can find most of my uh, resources. Okay, resources. You can find, uh, yeah, this is something wrong here. So we got a lot of spammers here as well. So I'll, what normally I'll do is just delete. Okay. So uh, here you can find a lot of our resources. Uh, if you want to join, you can join. If you have joined already, then that's okay. We will use some of uh, the templates here today. Okay, example, we will use... Um, literature database okay so we will use literature database here so you can find most of the templates here where to go and actually look for literature review and so on literature review databases okay then um, we will also use uh, this this uh, um, um, uh, 12 steps to systematic literature review this diagram here okay 12 steps to slr Okay, then also we will use, um, um, okay, what are the number of, uh, uh, what, what are the templates you can find in Telegram group? Okay, this is very important. So you can find templates related to literature search database. Then you can find critical literature review template. You can find literature summary template. You can find literature matrix template. Then you can find literature review and background writing, all the uh, link for statistical information, where to go and find statistics before you write your literature background. Uh, then problem statement template, very, very crucial, very, very important. Then inclusion, exclusion criteria, how to design this when you do systematic review, also very important. Uh, theoretical framework selection template, table of content template, and so on. Okay, so I'll also tag this on template. So you'll be aware what templates we have. Once you see this, you want to download that, just click search here and search for it and you can look for it here in the group, okay? So I hope that is helpful. Uh, and also um, our TikTok group, we have a lot of short videos will be useful for today. And also our Facebook page, I've shared the link. Now, how do you get all these links? Very simple, I have already created um, um, an ultimate link. Um, I call that universal link, which is this. This is a new uh, new link that I've created. What is this link? Let me show you. So once you click that link, uh, tr.ee, we call that link tree, okay, you'll go here. So you'll have all these um, um, uh, 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 links. So you can see how to complete thesis publication. You can also request for thesis and general templates. I can send you the PDF, uh, but you can also find it in my Telegram group. This is the Telegram group link. This is the past literature review class, paraphrasing class our Facebook group, all the free video classes, you can click here, TikTok, YouTube, all of it are here, 
Okay, so you don't need to worry about missing out on any links. This single link will give you all the resources that you need. I've already shared in the chat group. Please save it, keep it, and make use of all the free resources that we provide. Okay? That's that. So today we are going to cover um, why systematic review and where to publish them, types of review papers, systematic review process, criteria for SLR writing, journal versus thesis for systematic approach, when to write SLR papers, okay? First of all, for, oh, suddenly we have 85 now. Okay, very good number. Before we start, I want to, I want to check your basic knowledge, okay? Don't worry about saying don't know and no. I'm not your supervisor, so I won't judge you. I'm only here to share knowledge, so it's good if you say, in case if you don't know, just say you don't know. Why do you want to use systematic literature review? I want to hear it from you to understand your basic uh, knowledge regarding systematic literature review. So do share all of you in the chat box. Take one minute. Understand the concept to no research gap. Okay. <laughs> data question, data analysis process. Okay. For publication, yes. To identify problems, get generalized findings on a topic. Come on, everyone. Don't feel shy. If you are unsure, you can say, I'm unsure. Don't worry to say you don't know. Uh, Chan, please try to mute your mic, Chan. Okay, help me write chapter two, get proper flow of LR writing. Yep, ung text in, that's very, very important to complete. Mm -hmm. Recent studies and past studies on a topic, okay. Okay. Very good. So let me explain something. Okay. All right. That's good. If you remove this word, it's still a literature review, okay? If you remove the systematic literature review, whatever you guys want or you are, you are talking about now can be done with a normal literature review. You don't need systematic literature review. Normal literature review is known as narrative literature review. But then you can ask me, then why we need to do systematic literature review? It serves the same purpose, okay? It exactly serves the same purpose, but the methodology is different. This is a methodology. For narrative literature review, there is no methodology, all right? You can do however you want. You can use whatever database you want. You can ignore whatever paper you want to ignore. You, there is no inclusion, exclusion criteria. There is no assessment criteria, nothing, all right? So you can do whatever you feel comfortable with. That is the downfall of only literature review without systematic. But they serve the same purpose, okay? They serve the same, they serve the same purpose. It's like you're doing literature review, okay? Let's say this is your, this is your journey to literature review. Um, if you're doing normal narrative literature review, you are basically walking, 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 walking to literature review. If you do, uh, that means you go slow and steady. You explore a lot of things. You, you, you tend to explore a lot of things if you do a normal literature review. If you do systematic literature review, you will take a fighter jet, okay? A fighter jet, so you'll go here. But the problem with systematic literature review is you tend to miss out a lot of things. You tend to miss out, okay? Because when you, when you filter out the papers, when you have very strict inclusion exclusion criteria, you tend to miss out on a lot of papers. That's why when you start a PhD, very, very new, uh, you're just starting to read, 
try not to do systematic review. Don't. Do scoping review. That is what I will teach in the fourth class. Scoping review is more or less same like narrative review. But it has a methodology. Okay, it has a methodology. Narrative literature review is what you must do. Okay, without systematic. If you are at the beginning, very, very start of your research. That means you're still finding a problem. You're still finding a path to, to actually... Uh, um, to actually um, uh, find a problem that you want to solve. Okay, that means if you walk, you will slowly go through. You might find some 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 roads that you want to explore. Okay, but if you take the system literature review path, it's the fighter jet. You have no time to see all this. You go shoo, you go here. Sometimes you won't reach destination because you won't find a problem. Okay, because you already excluded a lot of important papers that sometimes you miss out on important information. Okay, I hope you guys understand the difference, yeah? Okay, types of journal papers. First, we have original research, the full deal. This is what known as empirical paper. That means you must have data set. Okay, someone said just now, uh, you, they don't need data set. Let me just quickly uh, look to that. Uh, da, 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 da. Ah, okay, from uh, Nur Sa uh, uh, Nuraisa. Nuraisa. Sorry, Nuraisa. So she is right. For systematic literature review paper, you don't need any data, all right? But empirical paper, you need. That is the only downfall of empirical paper. But to write systematic literature review paper is actually tougher than empirical paper because there is no data, so you must do a lot of extravaganza work to be able to publish a good systematic literature review paper. Rapid communications or letters, you can ignore this, okay? Review articles, this is where systematic literature review comes in. So we're going to focus a lot on this. Case studies are usually mostly for medical and uh, law. This is not the qualitative case study. Huh? This is actual cases, medical cases, legal cases, and so on. It's not the same with qualitative case, case study. Okay, why systematic review? Let's go back to the origin, where we started, because we're doing literature review now. 1753 was introduced by James Lee. Actually, he did systematic literature review without realizing he's actually doing systematic literature review. Okay, that means he set a certain methodology to follow. 1970 to 1980s received more attention. Okay, it originated in medical sciences. Usually, a lot of literature review method and so on, or methodology to research, comes from clinical study or medical study because it relates to humans' life. Okay, human lives. When that happens, uh, they are very, very rigorous, very, very careful of how they conduct research. And the ethical level will be usually very, very high. In the social science area, physics, engineering, and so on, we don't really have, we don't really look into so, so much of ethics because we don't uh, involve human lives. Okay, that means we don't endanger, uh, endanger human lives. Okay, if there is a study related to, uh, say, influenza or COVID, if they don't follow proper rigorous literature review method, they don't pro follow proper ethical method, some other people who refer to the paper, they start following the same approach, it might be life endangering. Okay, so that's why medical research always have very, very, very strong literature review assessment. Okay, next thing, why? Clear and comprehensive over available literature, see, very, com very comprehensive in terms of filtration, okay, helps identify research gap, able to highlight methodological concerns for future work, able to gain critical skills by conducting SLR, the approach, the methodology itself. How? First, define explicit research questions. Do a search on Prospero. Okay, if you're doing medical research, you can use Prospero. Usually, Prospero doesn't cover all subject area. You can see what are the existing SLR methods. Adopt comprehensive, objective, and reproducible search strategy. This is the most important key. When you do a literature review search, if other people cannot follow what you did, that means you never do a systematic research properly. Okay, or oh, at least not 90% there. You cannot be 100%. Sometimes you have to be at least 90, 95% so that other people can exactly follow your steps. They can get this. They should get almost the same results. They cannot get definitely the same results. Sometimes they can get almost the same results. And you can follow Prisma method in order to enable a proper process flow. Okay. Next thing, how to find suitable systematic review journals. Okay, let me ask you guys. For how many of you have written SLR paper here? Already published or writing or wrote or submitted? How many of you have already tried here? Please do comment in the chat box.
Anyone tried before? Don't feel shy. Even if you get rejected, it's okay. Don't worry. So no one tried systematic review paper before. Okay, that's very good. So today, today you're going to learn a lot of things. Okay, you're going to learn a lot of things. Now, before you prepare a systematic review paper, let's say you want to publish from your chapter two, you want to write systematic review paper. Let's say the moment you want to do that, first thing you must find out is which journal you are going to publish your paper in. You must choose at least three to five journals. You must prepare. Okay, you must prepare. Why? Because not all journals will publish systematic review paper. First item. Second item, every journal have different word range requirement. So you must have a typical word range. Example, some might only accept 11,000 words. Some might only accept 6,000 words. Some might only accept as low as 4,000 words. So if you go and choose a journal with 11,000 words, they accept. Okay, then let's say they reject. Now next journal you choose, it's 4,000 words only. You have to reduce from 11,000 all the way to 4,000. That is the problem. So you must always choose typical, okay, around eight to 9,000 words, you can choose. Uh, maybe you can set five different journals. Even if one reject, you can immediately just reformat, submit to another. You don't need to adjust the word count anymore. Okay, this is a very important strategy you must follow. Next thing, you must find out from the journal whether they accept systematic review paper or not. Okay, example here. If you look at this paper, this is from MDPI. Let me click here. So you can see MDPI Education Sciences, tracked for impact factor, that means it's going to be web of science soon. It is already a scopus, you can see side score here. Side score means scopus, impact factor. Impact factor means web of science, okay? Uh, copyright, can you please uh, mute your mic? Everyone, please mute your mic. Please don't forget to mute your mic, yeah? Okay, so impact factor means related, it relates to web of science journals. When they say side score, it relates to Scopus journals. So when you open a journal, you don't see impact factor, that means that is a Scopus journal. If you see impact factor, that means it is a web of science journal. Okay, remember that. Huh? So instruction for authors. Let's say you scroll down. You scroll down all the way. You look for the word review. Okay, too many. So what we can do? We can do systematic. Okay, ah, there you go. So this paper, types of publication, accepts two kind of papers. One, articles, which is empirical paper. Next one is reviews. These provide concise and precise updates on the latest progress made in a given area of research. Systematic review should follow the PRISMA guideline. So you know this journal accepts systematic review paper. Now let's go to the next one. Okay. Next journal. Journal of... Okay. Um, journal of Business Research. Okay, Journal of Business Research. This is another example I want to show you. Very, very strong journal. It has more than impact factor, I think 11 or 9, I think. All right, so if you see here, if you read along this line about uh, aims and scope, theoretical and empirical advances in buyer behavior, finance, organizational theory and behavior, marketing, risk and in, uh, insurance and international business are evaluated on a regular basis. Published for executive researchers and scholars alike, Alike, the journal aids the application of empirical research to practical situations and theoretical findings to the reality of the business world. Do you think this journal will accept systematic review or not? Yes, no, not sure. Three different answers you can give me. You can read the whole thing and then answer me. Anyone can tell me whether this journal, Journal of Business Research, will accept systematic review or not.
Oh, it's down here. Okay, sorry. Okay. So the answers are uh, no, 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 no. Yes, 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 yes. Not sure. Okay, all right. So that's good. So some say yes, some say no, some say not sure. Okay, agreed. So the best way to find out when you say yes and when you say no, when you say not sure, better to double confirm. For your own uh, benefit, better you should double confirm. How do you double confirm? Very simple. Go to Google Scholar. Okay. Okay, go to Advanced Search. All right, go to Advanced Search. I don't forget, huh? this is the Advanced Search button. If you've never used Advanced Search, you're missing out a lot when you're searching for paper. Under Advanced Search, you can search with all of the words, with the exact phrase, with at least one of the words, without the words, where my words occur. So what we're going to do is we're going to type here systematic review with all of the words. I'm not going to fill up the rest. Okay, but I'm going to fill up. Okay, then I'm going to choose where my words occur anywhere in the article, in the title. So I don't care. I just want anywhere. Then written articles authored by. Okay, I don't care about the author name. Written articles published in. Ah, okay, this one I want to choose the journal. So I want to choose Journal of Business Research. Okay, articles dated between. So okay, maybe I want to choose the most latest one. I want to choose 2020 to 2022. So I search now. Ah, there you go. All right. So this paper, this journal publishes systematic review. So you can see systematic meta analysis and systematic literature review. Review, review. So this is a bibliometric analysis, a systematic literature review, a review, a systematic literature review, a systematic review, a review. So there are many papers, systematic review. So all of these are Elsevier Business Research. Huh? So be sure of that. So from here, you can know, for those who said no, you can know that, yes, you can publish. For those who said yes, very good. I don't know how you find out, but this is the best way to reaffirm, reconfirm that the journal will accept or don't accept. Nura Sila, for, not be, for being not sure, this is how you can find out, all right? So you go to Google Scholar, you click at one search, and then you can do rest of the magic, right? You can also do a lot of things here when you do at one search, which will really uh, benefit your, your searching method, okay? Any questions so far? All of you can follow uh, so far. Okay, all right. Very good. So that is how you find out before you write a paper for systematic review journals. Okay, next thing. Fast publishing. How much to pay? All right. So my Helion journal that I published, okay, uh, I submitted in March and then uh, accepted by last week. Uh, no, accepted a few weeks ago. Then I we paid and then we published uh, last week. So that is around six months. Okay, six months, a couple of revisions, I think two revisions. Uh, we paid 1,980 USD, I think. Very expensive, very expensive. But, but we shared among authors, quite expensive. 1,950 USD. That is open access journals. These are also some of the examples of journals which will publish very quickly, especially MDPI. MDPI actually is more expensive, especially for Web of Science Journal. You can see it's 2,000 franc, all right? IEEE Access is also quite fast. Uh, it's a multidisciplinary journal, something you can consider. It's also expensive, US 1850. This is ISIQ2, ISIQ1, Helion is ISIQ1 as well. So now, how if I want to publish fast but free? Both won't work hand in hand. If you want free, they will take time. I had one or uh, two clients, no, one client uh, day before yesterday. Uh, a doctor from UPM, Dr. Ng. She submitted um, this year, February, to Elsevier. Until now, they haven't even allocated reviewer yet. Today is September already. Six months. No, never even went for review yet. Okay, that is free journal. I'm not saying it's, it's wrong to publish in free journal. If you don't mind waiting, if you're at the very beginning, go for free journal. Don't pay. If you're rushing, you want to publish fast, then you need to sacrifice that year's holiday. You cannot go for holiday, okay, unfortunately. Or you cannot pay a down payment for a new car. You need to pay for your journal, okay, because that's how much it costs. This is around uh, 2,000 USD. It's almost uh, 9,000 ringgit now, 
okay 1900 okay 2000 yeah it's about about almost about uh for about nine nine thousand plus already this one is even worse this is more than ten thousand already ringgit okay ringgit so um it's your choice okay no one forces you to publish open access or free that's why i always advise plan in advance plan way 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 earlier scopus is even worse scopus most of the journals are paid web of science at least you can find majority of journals to be free scopus 80 percent of journals are paid journals you have to pay but not so expensive it's about 500 usd some a thousand usd some are 200 usd and so on for scopus all right so that is how you can publish very fast but under scopus be careful some journals are predatory journal or scam journals web of science usually they are mostly good journals so be very careful when you're picking out the best journal for you next thing types of review papers so this is where we're going to explore what kind of review papers you can write don't be surprised that is the amount of review papers you can actually write so this is the first page this is the second page so there is no limited to only conceptual paper only narrative review paper only systematic review paper only scoping review paper. actually there are so many different papers you can write so let me just quickly go through blue color means narrative review red color means systematic review and then we have orange color which is scoping review okay scoping review is slightly different i will teach you in the fourth class okay here blue color narrative review we have critical don't worry i'll share the slides with you don't worry okay you can get uh, the slides from me and then you can go through yourself all right so under uh, uh, narrative review you have critical review here is all the description all the information that you need uh, literature review normal literature review paper mixed studies review mixed method review overview paper okay then we have uh, rapid review state of the art review umbrella review okay so these are all the uh, narrative review paper that you can uh, look into right next one red color okay systematic review mapping review systematic mapping meta analysis qualitative systematic review qual uh, qualitative evidence synthesis systematic review plain all system plain old systematic review systematic search and review systematized review okay sounds very uh, confusing right don't worry you can read through this i am pretty sure when you read through this you might find them almost similar yeah scientifically we tend to brand everything but end of the day when we check and go through properly you'll be like these are the same things why they are differently branded because different authors different authors sometimes will brand it differently and the moment they publish in web of science journal it becomes a brand okay so then they can start using that term so don't be too confused okay so that is systematic review then you have only single one scoping review it uses different method not not it not different methodology the source information the uh, database it can include anything you want mo almost anything you want systematic review you can only include journal article you cannot include everything that is the different i'll explain later uh, uh, along the way okay so that is the amount of review papers you can go through i don't want to waste my time going through all this or your time you can go through if it is important for you okay next thing sample review papers okay systematic review what kind of papers you can write what you must have in your paper this is a social science paper from dr kashif my very good friend all right uh, i i personally paraphrase and proofread this paper so i know this paper with my heart it's one of the best papers ever written the diagrams the the charts uh, the protocol the way we have explained the paper everything is beautiful all right this is an ssci q1 general impact factor 3.67 it focuses on tqm practices okay total quality management practices if you see one of the important charts he provided in his paper is this graph okay a graph that shows exponential okay now i want to ask you guys let me explain a bit more the x-axis are all years published okay that means from 1994 to 2019 and then um, the y-axis explains the quantity the number of papers published relative to the years okay so from this graph why okay not from this graph. why do you think it's important to include this graph why from your logical thinking to show the trend why why it's important to show the trend why 
Okay, read one. Anyone else? Don't don't worry to try. Okay, don't be afraid to try. The reason that you're doing PhD is because you're not afraid to try. Okay, so even if you temba, it's okay. Just temba. It's fine. At least we know how you're thinking. Don't know. Very good. To understand the gap. Not really. Okay, but never mind. Growing articles. Okay, clear justification with accurate data. All right. To see important topics over the years. Very good, Intan. Very good. To see whether it's still demanding in the field. Very good, Tian Tian. Include more information. Not really. Don't include more information just because you want to include. You must include with purpose. With purpose. The reviewers must see there is a purpose. Clear justification and gap. Not really. Not really. But it's okay. You guys, it's okay to try. All right. So at least you know how you are logically thinking. To show the latest data, yes and no. Okay, yes in a way. To mapping the current issues, okay, yes in a way. Anyone else wants to try? Represent data and proof justification. In a way, yes. Okay, let me tell you something. As a reviewer, okay, as a reviewer, I'm looking at a review paper, or as an editor, I'm looking at a review paper. I'm like, do we really need to look into TQM practices, soft and hard, who cares? Is it really important to review this article? And then once I look at this graph, I'm like, oh, okay, from 1994 to 2019, not many people reviewed here. Okay, it's kind of flat and then it slowly start increasing and then flat and then increase again. So it is showing that over this particular range of years, it has very high importance, a lot of people growing interest in this area. So it is a hot topic. Okay, hot. This is called hot zone or you can call it hot zone. It shows hot zone. So what you can, if, if you draw a, a curve, a curve fitting, it will show something like that. So what is this? This is an exponentially growing graph. Exponential. So exponential you will have like that. Reverse exponential is like that. Okay. This is reverse exponential. Huh? This is exponential. Okay. Exponential will eventually become a histogram like that. Okay. So what is important for you to show is when you do a search, you must make sure that the, gra the graph is either flat or going up. It shouldn't be like that. Uh, if it's already increased and flattened already, that means there is no interest. Let's say over the years, let's say this particular graph, it became like that and then like that. Oh, sorry. Like that, increased here and then like that. And this is 2019. This is the latest one. Uh, this one, very hard to justify, to do review because the review will ask you, there is no more interest in this area. Probably it's obsolete already. Why do I need to do review? Why, why should you do review in this area? No one cares about this topic anymore. You see, the trend is going down. So when you do literature review, this is important for you to know whether that particular area, you can find any research gap or not. Whether that particular topic has any interest or not, globally. So this is, this is the graph that can show you whether... It's important for you to choose this topic or should you switch topic at the beginning of your research. It is important. Uh, yes, of course you can, Anis. Of course you can. You, it's good to include. Okay, at least you can show to your reviewer. If, if not reviewer, examiner ask you, why do you do this research? Well, how sure are you this topic is relevant? Bam, you can show this. Now, nah, there you go. Take and go. Okay, this already proven fact. Already explained to you already. Okay, so definitely it's a good thing to include actually. So make sure you go for a graph that is like that or like that or like that or like that. Okay, anything that is flat is still okay because it might be growing slowly. It might not get the full attention yet. But don't go for a topic. Not I wouldn't say don't go. Uh, better not to go. Okay, better not to go for something like that. Flat or very slow growth already, very, very slow, or something that actually dropping already. Huh. Don't go for this kind of topic. 
because that means it's getting obsolete. People don't like it anymore. Like my PhD, uh, my PhD, at the time when I was starting, my topic was like that. Okay, now after 10 years, it's becoming like that already. So now if I go and start a PhD research here, people will call me a dummy, a pure dumbo. <laughs> okay, so don't, you must only focus if you can potentially in this area. You can, it's not harm, it's not wrong to focus here unless you have a reviving solution. Okay, to be able to revive this entire technology, this entire topic, if your solution can answer and pick this out again, ah, that is good, that you can do. Okay, that you can look into. That will be a very, very good research. Okay, so that is, that's why this graph is very important. Followed by uh, your flow of uh, database, your flow of search, data search. Using Web of Science, Scopus. Google Scholar is not very good for systematic review, not very good. Why? I will tell you in my fourth class. So make sure you guys come and attend my fourth class because fourth class is hands-on class. I'm going to teach you how to do search. All right. So if you don't come for fourth class, you won't know how to use Web of Science Scopus and you won't know why Google Scholar will not be suitable for systematic review. Google Scholar is very good if you don't do systematic. That means at the beginning, sorry, at the beginning of your research, if you are just exploring, Google Scholar is the best. All right. It's the best. Then once you already decided your topic, then start using Web of Science, Scopus, PubMed, and so on. Okay, because Google Scholar will give you everything. Okay, everything that is under the roof, everything. Then you design your research protocol. This is what we call a systematic protocol. All your research flow. Okay. Same goes to medical side as well. If any medical students are here, if there is any any health related research, this is also another journal that we that we worked on, or Australian Dental Journal, ISI Q2, SCI Q2, Imperfector 2.419. This is a bit different. This is systematic review and meta-analysis. Okay, that's meta-analysis. Meta-analysis, if you see, the protocol is the same. But there will have there will be statistical information. Okay, you will actually carry out statistical review. Okay, or review of statistics. You'll conduct some statistical analysis, SPSS and so on, between your results and other papers' results as well. It's called meta-analysis. A bit complex, but if you want to publish Web of Science Q1, Q2, with systematic review, if you add in meta-analysis, very, very high chances. Very high. It's not easy though. Okay. Next one. A very good engineering-related papers. If you have any engineering students here, any uh, education-related PhD that is related to engineering, this is a good research to good paper to look at. This is quite recent, I think almost end of last year from UM. This paper also we worked on paraphrasing, proofing, editing, and structuring. Review on maintenance issue toward building maintenance management best practices. This is from Faculty of Build and Environment, okay, civil engineering. So SCI Q1, impact factor 5.318. You can see they use histogram to talk about issues. They don't talk about uh, uh, what do you call that histogram. They never talk about yes. They talk about their themes, which particular area has a lot of focus, and their uh, research protocol, systematic protocol. And at the end of the re uh, research, their ultimate result is the conceptual framework of the study. So it doesn't matter if you do quantitative research or non-quantitative research, doesn't matter. You can always draw a conceptual framework. Even qualitative work, you can draw a conceptual framework to depict your solution. This is the solution that they are depicting. It is not quantitative. There is no hypothesis, nothing. They're basically talking about maintenance issues in Malaysia, recommendation to solve issues, maintenance management best practices. Under all these uh, branches, what are the things that they should do during maintenance issues? What they must do? So based on the review, this is the recommendation profile they have created. Okay, that is what you want to achieve end of the day in your review paper. If, especially if you want to publish in Scopus Q1, Q2, uh, Web of Science and so on, these are the things that you should do. What is the end result you're going to give as part of your review paper? If it is all words from top to bottom, it won't be that effective sometimes. Okay? All right? Next thing, systematic review process. Before I start, any questions? If I'm going too fast, let me know. Okay? Because we only have another hour left. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask. I normally will stop at certain point when I know that I might 
uh, overwhelm you guys. So I try to stop. If you have any queries, you can ask. If nothing, I'll just continue. Okay, so nothing. All right. So we have systematic and scoping. Both are under the same methodology. Almost the same. System, however, systematic, the scope, it will usually have very, very specific question. That's why I say don't do systematic if you don't know what you are exploring. You don't know what you're looking at because you don't have a specific question yet that you want to answer. Subject specific known. Quantitatively or qualitatively answer a specific question. Even this, you might not know whether quantity or quality. So don't do systematic review at the very beginning. At the very beginning, just do narrative review. Be very narrative based. Search whatever you can search. Include whatever you want to include. Later on, you can filter out. Then you can do a proper systematic literature review once you have already decided this is the title. This is the topic. I want to find research gap now. And then you can deep dive using systematic review. You have scoping review. Okay, scoping review is very suitable if you don't have any specific topic. Okay, let's say you want to explore uh, education with IR 4.0. It's a very, very broad topic. You don't even know which one you want to explore. So, no specific topic. That means no narrow topic. You just want to look at IR 4.0 in education. It can be used for curriculum development. It can be used for technology-based teaching. It can be used for uh, many different purposes. Okay, uh, Leadership quality with IR 4.0. What kind of technology you can implement in place. What kind of information system you can implement to manage a school. Uh, policy development. Many different things you can look at. So, it is very broad. So, you use scoping review method. It addresses a very broad topic, provides an overview of the available research evidence without producing a summary answer to a very specific question. It is not specific. It's very, very broad. Okay, that is the differences. Okay, when is scoping and when is systematic review? From this diagram, okay, how many of you here never seen this diagram before? This is my PhD uh, developmental diagram. This is how I guide even supervisors. Okay, we, we train supervisors in UCIM, upcoming UTP, uh, very soon will be UPNM and many different universities. We are training the supervisors, to junior supervisors, lah, to follow these steps when they're supervising students. How many of you never seen this before? Okay, may ye. How about studies are so scarce? Can I do systematic? If very scarce, don't do systematic. Just do general search. Especially when it's cast, you might easily miss out on um, essential papers. So do a normal, um, I'm going to remove my mic huh, because we are, we are only using chat box. Um, you can use um, normal Google Scholar search. Don't use Web of Science. Uh, don't, don't do systematic search. Okay, so how many of you here, please kindly answer, who never seen this diagram before. If you have seen, I won't explain. I'll just go straight to the point. Okay, quite a bit of people never seen this diagram before, all right. Patin. Okay, so let me quickly explain. Eh? This is my PhD consultancy framework. Okay, this is what I've developed in order to guide students, masters and PhD both to know what they need to do at every step, how they can go forward. Next step, what I do. Next step, what I do. Why did I design this, this particular diagram? Because uh, when I was doing PhD, I had no clue what to do next. I believe some of you might have the same problem as well. Like, uh, what do I do next, doctor? Uh, can I uh, write paper now? Or do I need to write my chapter 2 or chapter 1, chapter 3? Or do I uh, go and read more papers? What do I do now? You know, a lot of people ask that question. So what I did, I came up with this diagram. This was also developed during 2020 MCO time. When I had a bit of free time, I thought, hmm, why don't we develop a guideline, a framework for students to follow? So they can follow easily. They know what to do next. All right. So even our consultancy, our coaching program, we follow these steps. So now I've already split these steps into PhD proposal and PhD thesis. Okay. Proposal and thesis are two different things. A lot of people confuse that. A lot of people come and ask me, doctor, I need coaching for my thesis. Then when I show this, this diagram to them, they say, okay, uh, please coach me from step 1 to step 11. I say, cannot. 
No way. Every university, normally they'll go, proposal first. You must have a breaking point. Okay, there is a breaking point to decide whether your idea is good to go or not. That's why you do a proposal. Okay. So, step number one is 10 pages proposal. When you start a PhD or, when you start a PhD or master's, keep in mind, always do a 10 pages proposal, which includes introduction, of course, includes title, then introduction, background, problem statement, ROQ, significance, literature review, theory, um, conceptual framework or thematic framework or whatever solution, depending on your subject area. Uh, theoretical framework also depending on subject area. Some people don't have theory, so they use mathematics or they can use economics uh, uh, model or they can use a lot of different things you can use as a replacement to theory. And then conceptual framework will be your solution, can be in any form, a system, a chemical composition, economical model that you want to implement, many different ways. And number 10 is methodology. Okay, so you, that's why uh, there will be 10 different steps for you to complete. Not necessarily must follow the flow. You can change here and there, but just to present your idea to your supervisor. Because without doing this, people will tell you, I don't want to do this. I want to go straight here, chapter 1 to 3. I will tell them up to you. Okay, if after you finish writing a chapter 1 to 3, you go to give your supervisor, it, al it is already about 80 pages. If your supervisor suddenly look at it, then they find it, it's not within the scope of their own research, they don't want this proposal, you cannot do anything. You have to scrap the whole 80 pages, 2 to 3 months or maybe 5 months of your work gone. Finish. Whether you, can, you write this through coaching or you write it on your own, doesn't really matter. If your supervisor don't agree, you are going to scrap the whole thing. That's why to avert the risk, to reduce the risk, to completely avert the risk, you do 10 pages proposal first. This is a summary of this. Okay, it's a very, very narrowed down version. Okay, so therefore your supervisor will know to a certain extent what your PhD is going to be. When they want more information, more development, more modification, then you know they already have interest. That means you can now start modifying. Okay? Doesn't mean they won't change. I've seen students where the supervisor is only halfway through, they'll be like, mm -mm, I don't want this change. Scrap the whole thing. I have seen before. That's why when you go to step number two, when you start, when you say supervisor, say, okay, I like it. Start developing now. Okay, then you go. Don't straight away write chapter one, two. They don't go one, two, three, and then go to your supervisor. No, don't ever do that. When you write chapter 1, go to supervisor, get feedback, improve chapter 1, then go chapter 2, go to supervisor, come back, then go 3, go to supervisor, come back. That is our normal process flow. That's how we will advise. Some supervisors don't like that. But I will advise students to try to convince supervisor because that way you're actually saving the supervisor's time and you are also assuring that you're on the right path. Okay? After that, you can do your proofreading. Let's say your supervisor say, okay, I like it. Let's move forward. Let's go for proposal defense. Then you go for proofreading. While you're doing proofreading, you can start extracting two different journals here. Okay. When is scoping? When is systematic? Scoping review journal, actually, you can start generating from here. Okay. Here you can write, start writing a scoping review journal. Maybe for a scopeless journal, it's fine. Next class, I'll teach you how to write scoping review journal from the, this stage itself. Okay. So that is when you write scoping review journal. Here, this step here, you can write systematic review paper and you can also write conceptual paper. So this is what we are focusing on today. This is something very general. If you want a reference point for all of this, for all the new joiners, you can go to my Telegram group. For those who haven't joined yet, I recommend you to go and join because once you go here, you type conceptual concept. Okay, this is a concept paper, my own concept paper, okay? So if you want to know whether concept paper can go to Q1 or not, I published this this year, Open Innovation of Institutional Investors and Higher Education System in Creating Open Approach for SDG4, Quality Education, a conceptual review. You can download the paper here. Concept paper with scoping review. You can have a look how to actually write a concept paper with scoping review. Let me pin this. Okay, and one other concept paper you can write is here. Um, here, album. So, scoping review sample, SLR sample, 
Web of Science Q1 concept paper sample one more. This is Q1 top five journal. Uh, concept, another concept paper sample from uh, UPM Putra Business School, Prof. Sazali. Okay, these are all the papers that I've personally worked on. So I know all these papers by heart. So this is uh, review papers. You can go and download. Who haven't joined Telegram group, please let me know immediately. I can give you the link and you can go and join. Okay, type in the chat box. All right, so you can go and download all these for reference point. When you start writing, you can actually uh, uh, download uh, all these papers, have a look. So you can understand the structure. You can understand what you need to write, how you need to write, and you can start producing. Okay, so for those who haven't joined the Telegram group, you can uh, request uh, the link in the chat box. Uh, never, oh, never, never join. Okay, it's fine. So what you can do, um, one moment, yeah, Fatin. Sorry, one moment. Okay, so um, can I have the link? Because, yeah, sure. So you go to this link. Okay, this is a universal link, which will link to all my uh, information, all my resources. So from here, you can look for Telegram link and click that, that particular button. Okay, then you can immediately join the Telegram group and you can go and download all these resources. All right, it's filled with resources, that particular group. All right, so now next part. Okay, once you have decided, you can, while proofreading or while your supervisor revising, you can start writing your papers. Produce your papers. Once your supervisor response or proofreading finish, you continue while your papers, these two papers or three papers or one paper, you send to your supervisor. Your supervisor smiley face. Huh? Let them review. Now you start preparing for defense. So normally here, this is the point where we will normally train to here. These are all coaching point, coaching point or consulting point. This is where we then the proofreading point and then we will train them for defense. Okay, we will teach them how to go and defend. We will scrutinize, we will grill them, screw them, we will not screw them, I mean, we will grill them. And then also we will teach them how to do slides. When, when it comes to slides, remember, it's 70, 30. 70% 70 diagrams, 30% wording, okay? Once that is done, go for proposal defense. After proposal defense, you will get corrections, whether minor or major, do it immediately. Do it while your brain is fresh. Okay, while you have a lot of information, do it immediately. Okay, this is one of our major consulting point because by here, students are already exhausted. Okay, already exhausted. No problem, Ramlan. Okay, thanks, thanks, thanks in a million as well for joining today. All right, so this is the point where you can um, um, uh, definitely seek for coaching. This part is very crucial. You must do the corrections in a very precise manner. Must do. Okay, must do. And do it immediately. Don't take your own sweet time. Because one thing you have to remember, the moment you start using references here, the references has a expiry period. Because when you reach here, the examiner wants to see less than five years. If you take 10 years or five years or seven years or six years to reach here, those references are already obsolete, already old already. Then you must replace everything again. Okay, so the sooner you reach here, the better it is for you. Yeah, then once you, once you cross this path, your examiner already okay, your supervisor say okay for the, for the revision and so on. Then you start collecting your data. However you collect, you collect. Then you start doing the analysis for chapter 4 and 5. We normally focus on Smart PLS, AMOS, uh, SPSS, eViews, sometimes MATLAB, uh, and um, uh, sometimes NVivo and so on and so forth. Okay, We don't use Atlas for quality because Atlas have very little uh, guidelines, very little people who are using to help. NVivo is a bit more uh, uh, very widely used. Okay, Better, you got more resources. Once uh, uh, chapter 4 and 5 done, you need to do this very, very, very important step. Very, very important. Chapters 1 to 5 alignment. Okay, This is where you take your chapters 1 to 3, your proposal or your corrected proposal, and then you take your chapter 4 and 5, you combine them. Okay, Once you combine them, you have to align your chapter 1, your chapter 2, your chapter 5. You must align all of that, update references, expand further, Align means you must synchronize your result, your discussion must synchronize your literature review. This is a very, very important step. Once that is done, then you can start extracting more journals. You can start extracting empirical papers and meta-analysis papers. Why? Because you already have your results. While that is going on, this one you can send to your supervisor for review already. Supervisor say, okay, smiley face, then you continue to proofread. Proofreading, it's good to do after supervisor say, okay. 
try not to do before because after proofreading, then only you send to your supervisor, then supervisor give correction, you correct, 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 go back and forth, back and forth. It's already a different copy from what you're proofreading. Then you have to spend money again to proofread. Don't, don't waste your money like that. A lot of proofreaders won't tell you this, this, how they actually make extra money, but I don't do that because um, this is already a struggle. We don't want to uh, scrutinize it more. We don't want to make it worse. So I'm telling you the right process. Go to your supervisor here. Then only send for proofreading once everything is okay. Once that is done, okay, um, while proofreading, start preparing your slides. Start uh, mock, mock viva. Mock viva is one of our most essential thing that we do. Okay, we really, really scrutinize. Then you go for your external examiner. A lot of people say you don't need to proofread until after Viva. After Viva only you proofread. What's the point? What is the point of you proofreading after Viva? Who is going to read it after that? After your Viva, you will hard bind and you keep it on a shelf. And forever in your life, you will never open it. Okay. For the past 10 years, I never opened my thesis. It's sitting on my shelf. Every time I look at it, I'm very proud. But then I'll be thinking all the struggle that I went through. Okay. So... Don't do proofreading. I can see people laughing already. Okay, don't, 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 don't do proofreading after Viva. No one is going to read it. Okay, it is a historical book. Do you open history book and read? Do you read when British come to Malaysia and so on? You don't. Who cares? Already done. Sometimes people tell and we talk about it. So it's already history. You must do proofreading before Viva because you know why? You want to give the best to your examiner. Okay, you want your examiner to read and understand every single thing that you have written. Okay, you don't want them to go reading halfway through and then don't understand what you just said. Be, that is the worst thing you want to do to your examiner because he is going to come back very hard on you. Very, very hard. The moment they know you never do proofreading, you, that means it shows that you don't care. They might not know that probably you lack of fun, you got no resources, maybe you didn't have enough time. They don't care about all that. Okay, even supervisors sometimes they don't care. They have no time to care. Okay, I mean that is the reality, right? Because they, they want you to, you're, because you must understand, not, not in a bad way, PhD is adult learning. So you must be able to manage your time. You Sometimes you cannot expect a bit of leeway. Sometimes no, it won't happen. So you must be prepared. This is the process flow, you know already. Plan in advance. How long you will need for proofreading here? Minimum one month. Anyone says can proofread your thesis for within two weeks, you are going to get screwed royally. Confirm, 100% guarantee. Why? Because to read a 200 pages thesis itself, just reading will take you two to three weeks. You try taking 200 pages thesis and read and see how long you will take. At least two to three weeks. How can a proofreader proofread in two to three weeks? Think about it logically. This is your final frontier. This is your final step. Don't take risk. Minimum one month is required to proofread a thesis properly. Okay, even after then, sometimes we still get comments. We still get. We are humans also. So I can tell you, sometimes we still get language-related comments. Sometimes. Most of the times we get excellence. Okay, sometimes we'll get some uh, petty comments. When we go through, we'll start laughing. Okay, so my advice to you is don't do it after here. After here is already history. It's going to go sit on your shelf and look at you and smile at you all over the next... Uh, However long you're going to live, lah, okay? I honestly I never seen my hardbound thesis now in my house. I never seen it for probably two years now, okay? It's somewhere in my storeroom. I never even see, okay? So don't bother what is going to happen after Viva. After Viva, you just do your correction properly, do your content-related correction and just submit. What is important is everything before the Viva. How are you going to impress your, your, your examiners, your internal and your external examiners, especially if they're coming from overseas, you better make sure your English is perfect. All right, this is my personal advice to you. You can use any proofreader you want, any anyone you want. Doesn't matter. Okay, it's not just me only. You can use anyone you want. There is American Journal Expert. There is Eddie Touch, and so on. You can choose whoever you want. Make sure they take more than a month, and make sure they do a good job. Okay, so that is done. Then you start preparing for your viva. Your slides must be excellent. All right, excellent. Then here. Your, your viva, come back, you got major or minor, do the corrections in a very relaxed way, don't worry, you're almost done, and then you can submit. Okay, but make sure you do every corrections precisely well. Perfection is important at this point, because if your internal external goes through, they don't like, they will ask you to redo again. What you don't want at this point is reviva. You don't want reviva. Okay, so I've explained to you step by step, 
If you need this diagram, go to my website. How to go to my website? Again, go back to my universal link I've given you. One of the button will take you to my website. You can find this diagram on my website. Okay. And last but not least, how do we normally coach and consult students? We have four different modes. Okay, four different modes. Mode one and two, modes one and two are more for people who have already written, already established proposal clearly, but still, you know, a bit skeptical and so on, or thesis a bit skeptical, publication a bit skeptical, want some input from experts, content commenting, and online coaching. These two would work very well for people who are already almost there. But if you're at the very basic level, still very, very confused, supervisor not accepting, supervisor keep rejecting and so on, Accelerator Thesis Consultancy will build a coaching plan for you, whether publication, proposal or thesis, or you can go for content editing for special cases. These are all four different modes that we provide, okay, depending upon what you need. Okay, now coming to SLR methodology. When we come to methodologies, there is no only Prisma. Okay, Prisma is preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis created by Prof. Mohe back in 2009. This is history. Okay, but no one cares really now. Same goes to your thesis after your heart bound. Same story. No one cares. As long as people can use Prisma, we are happy. So, Prisma has in total 27 items for you to cover. You cannot cover each and every item because it was meant for clinical research. It was meant for clinical, not for social science, education, engineering, no. So some of the items you cannot cover. Then you have another method, uh, another method called Ramses, 19 items. Then you have Roses, okay? And then Prisma 2020 already replaced 2009. There's a new update now. If you want to know more details about the update, no worries. You go to my Ultra link, okay? This is the Ultra link, huh? You go to free video classes. Okay, for those who don't know where to get my website, uh, where is my website? Website is supposed to be somewhere here. Yep, that's my website. So you can scroll down here and check out the diagram here. Here, this is the diagram, okay? So this, this link will take you directly to these videos. From these videos, you can um, look for systematic review. Systematic. is one more prisma prisma okay there is prisma there you go systematic literature review and prisma 2020 this one will explain everything you need to uh, know about prisma 2020 this class over here okay if you're going to do systematic review make sure you know this prisma 2020 okay um, uh, Miss Sara, I think uh, the students are asking for the uh, um, uh, attendance link. Uh, link Gardiran, can you please share? All right, so make sure you register yourself okay, so that okay. I can email all of you the notes and uh, the slides and so on. Okay, so those are the methodologies. Now, what SLR basics? It's just an alternative method, as I explained at the beginning of the class. Databases, you can use Scopus, Science Direct, Google Scholar, not so much because it's very confusing. But the best is Web of Science and Scopus. These two would be enough. Boolean searches, you can use or and or at one search function from Google Scholar. Direct search is the first level you do and then after you can do snowballing. Snowballing means from whichever journal that you have downloaded. Okay, uh, no problem copyright. I don't know your name, sorry. <laughs> okay, um, from direct search and snowball, from snowballing, once you already did the direct search, the first level search, okay, and then you take, okay, from 100 papers, you take only 70 papers. From that 70, you can do snowballing, SB. Snowballing has forward and backward. From that snowballing, you get more papers. Let's say you get another 30 more papers. You do another filtration of these 30. In parallel, you have the 70. This one maybe will become 15. So 70 plus 15 will become 85. That's how it works. Okay, that's the process flow. Okay, inclusion exclusion must be decided carefully so that, to, to, uh, so that you can avoid review papers and you specify the timeline as well. Screening processes and independency, examining titles, abstracts and whatever required according to the title. Build literature matrix as you do your filtration. Upon filtration, quality assessment to be conducted qualitatively. You can decide high, moderate or low. And then you can decide based on that. 
Okay, so this is all Prisma Nightmare. You can see these are the 27 items. Item under title, abstract, introduction methods. You can see title number one, number two, abstract, number introduction number three, objectives number four, methodology of five, six, seven, eight, all the way to 13. 13, you got few different uh, things in 13, under 13. And then you got 14 all the way to 27. Don't worry, I will give you the slides. You can go through each and everything because this coverage itself is one day workshop to cover this. But under two hours, I won't be able to explain everything. And you don't need to know everything because you know what? I've already simplified this whole process. I Okay, uh, before I go to my simplified process, these are the noteworthy changes of 2020 from, 20, from 2009. This is 2009, okay? After 2009, they added these items in 2020. These are the updated version of Prisma guideline. Okay, you can go through later when I give you the slides. However, okay, I'll, I'll come to that. But before that, um, selection of databases. Okay, now before you start the systematic review process, how can you decide which database I can use? How do I know I use Google Scholar or Web of Science or Scopus or PubMed or Science Direct or many different things? So example here, what are the number of databases are there? You just click here, go to search. Oh, actually, I have tagged already. So you go here, literature review database, you see. These are all the databases. Sorry, this thing is blocking. Let me open my PDF file. So you can download the PDF here. So you can see there is all subject databases, Web of Science, Scopus, Google Scholar, Archive, by Cornell, Ulrich, Science Direct, Director Open Access, JSTOR. These are all the links. Then medical databases, iSight, PubMed, Engineering, Inspire, Hub, IEEE, Explore, iMac, Social Science, Silo, Eric. These are all the databases you can use. But how to know which one to use? Yeah, very simple. These are the methods. Again, uh, you can remember, download this. Okay, no problem. Thank you, Ern. Thank you. You can watch the recording later, yeah? All right. So, you recognize the database based on prior systematic literature review. Okay, look at system literature review in your same topic, see what databases they have used. You can decide based on that. After that, you can also ask your supervisor or co-author to advise which database to use. And then always stick to databases that provides high impact research. Very important that you do that. Now, how do you explain that in writing? This is a very good example. From a very important paper, I'll provide this paper today as part of the notes today. These databases were chosen based on systematic review guidelines from the Social Care Institute for Excellence, SEIE. The experiences of other researchers, okay, see, these are all other researchers they have used. Based on them, they choose the database. Consultation with subject librarians. So this one can be your co-authors, your supervisor, um, a research group leader or whoever and scoping exercises for relevant literature and on accessibility within Ulster University where the work was undertaken, right? Due to the nature of the topic, it was advisable to include databases from both education and social care, social services, as well as a multidisciplinary database, which was Scopus. Psych Info was included because of its focus on behavioral and social science research. This is how you can explain. Very important that you explain this, why you choose a, B, C, D databases. Why? You must explain. In narrative review research, you don't need to explain all this. No one cares. They you just say, I do literature review across all databases. Done. Okay? Okay, I already shared the file with you. You have this file now for my Telegram group. JCR. Okay, don't worry about this. Web of Science Search, I will show you in the next class. I've already prepared the slides for the fourth class. Part of it is to show you how to search journals in Web of Science. So don't worry about this. Last time I only, uh, in previous classes in other universities, I only teach them about this. But next class, I'm going to teach you hands-on how to use it. All right? Okay, Google's cover, Google Scholar covers all. So it is not really suitable systematic because it covers everything. And you must use double quotation to be very specific. You can use title apps key to search a particular keyword. You can use uh, um, uh, this kind of brackets for exact phrase. You can use question mark in the in the in the in the event of plural and singular problem. Okay, this plural. This is uh, uh, plural. This is singular. Okay, and or or as boolean operator when you use multiple keywords. Okay, so this you must use them uh, in a group. You must use them like you know you must have quotation marks. You must have certain bracket. You must use and all together sometimes to get the precise 
search. Okay. And how far a search can be? This is how complex a search can be. Title, EBSCII, prevent, column, or title, EBSCII, delay, uh, quotation, or title, EBSCII, redux. You see here, they use star. Uh, okay, so because they want redux and also reduction or reduce. Okay, so anything that says reduce, reduction, uh, uh, and so on, it will be searched as well. So that's why you star here. And title, EBSCII, systematic review, or title, EBSCII, meta analysis, and title, EBSCII, lifestyle change, or lifestyle modification or lifestyle rotation or lifestyle intervention or lifestyle therapy or lifestyle treatment. This is how crazy a search can be. Honestly, I have never did this kind of search before. Okay, I've never done it to this level. I just do single, 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 single search. Okay. Uh, may I know about general packages prices? I tend to not discuss that during the class, but however, if you if you want to inquire about our services, you can WhatsApp us directly. Mahadevan, I've given the link already. That's my direct WhatsApp link. Okay, all right, next thing. This is systematic review protocol, a very, very, very complex protocol. So if you are doing a systematic review, this is how actually you should do or you shouldn't do, up to you actually, depending. So research question, you can use PICO or SPIDER. Uh, oh, we are running out of time. Preliminary search, uh, you can see the items here. Huh? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. It looks very complex, right? Very, very complex. So what I did, I simplified it. I simplified the whole systematic review search into 12 simple steps. Very, very simple steps. You can get the diagram here. I've tagged already. Uh, let me see. It's right here. Okay, you can download it here. Okay, so step number one, okay. Another thing I have to also explain to you, um, in case if you want to, um, one moment, uh, okay, if you go here, you go to my TikTok, very, very, very recently, I'm not doing any more video, I don't have time yet, I'll do very soon. If you look at this particular video, okay, 12 Easy Step Systematic Literature Review, I've already explained the entire processes on my TikTok video. So you can go and watch it there, make sure you click follow, uh, follow button lah, okay, or uh, uh, is it follow, I think it's follow button, okay, so you can find the complete explanation of this diagram, okay, let me give you a quick one, eh? formation of research question or problems, so you must know your research question and problems first, before you start doing systematic review, that means you must do a scoping review first, or a narrative review first, before you do a systematic review, step two, preliminary search to validate the idea to assure none had done it before, you must make sure that no one else had done the same systematic review that you are doing now so that you don't waste your time. I've seen people getting rejected because of that. Huh? After they do proofreading, everything, they submit, look at the, uh, look at the uh, uh, references, the reviewers picked up. They say, hey, these people almost very close, already done systematic review. Don't redo this, reject. They cannot do anything, okay? Because the next general also, they might find the same result. So they, they had to redo the whole paper. Step three, set the inclusion and exclusion criteria based on research question and preliminary search. Search strategy, mention the keywords used, Boolean operators and filters. I will teach you this very, very detailed in the next coming class. Step number number five, databases explored, web of science, scopus and etc. Use Mendeley or EndNote to remo remove duplicates. When you search for multiple databases, when you download the sources, you will have duplicate papers. Okay, so you, when you combine all of that in EndNote and Mendeley, you, the, the, that software itself will remove the duplicates for you. You don't need to worry. All right. Step number six, write the protocol. I already told you the protocol earlier. Now start screening. From the protocol, from whatever paper you have, you start screening the title and abstract, and you start applying your inclusion, exclusion, and exclude whichever you don't want. Then from the next level, you move to full text. From the full text, again, you go back to inclusion, exclusion. You exclude whatever you don't want. Okay, so from there, next thing, you do snowballing. From the included papers, you do snowballing. That means you go to the references, you see any relevant papers that you might miss out, and you also go to uh, future papers. You go to Google Scholar, you type out the link, you go to Cited By. From there, you can do forward snowballing. Okay, this is known as snowballing. Once you have done all that, you have a total number of papers, then you do quality assessment based on specific criteria decided by authors. 
Then number 11, once you have removed finally everything, start reviewing all the selected papers and extract similar and differential information. Step number 12, produce literature matrix if you want to. Some people do, some people don't. Okay, I've seen both also, both cases. And then you can start writing a paper or thesis. This is the entire systematic review processes I have done for you in a very easy way to understand. Okay. Backward snowballing, basically you capture literature from references. Whatever papers that you have already included, you capture the papers from references. Forward snowballing, you capture not from the references, but which paper in the future have cited this paper that you have included. Let's say this paper you have included is from 2020. So you go to Google Scholar, you search this paper. Then under that, you can see cited by. You click that, you can see in 2020, 2021 and 2022, which papers have cited this particular paper that you are looking at. So those are all forward snowballing. Next item, inclusion exclusion criteria. Okay, so based on this title, all right, you can have inclusion, educational impact of being a young carer for age 16 to 24. From this title, you include young carers age 16 to 24, and you include education. You excluded foster care, children in care, looked after children. You don't need all this. This one, no need. So from this, you must calculate sensitivity and precision. You go through the the formula here, what, okay, let me tell you very simply, what does this mean? Very simple. If your sensitivity is low, that means your precision is high, you will have lesser keywords, lesser keywords, okay? This is a very good example of high precision, less sensitivity. What will happen? You will get lesser papers. You won't get many papers. So don't do that. Okay, you need more papers. So you want to add more keywords if possible. So that way you can increase sensitivity, reduce precision. Because precision, you can filter through your quality assessment, your 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 your, your other, I mean, uh, your title EPSCI exclu exclusion as well. Okay, you can do that. That's fine. So uh, if you look at my Telegram group again, go to inclusion template. I've explained already here, uh, here. Hey, no, not this. Uh, inclusion, exclusion template. Uh, where is it? Huh? Okay, there you go. Okay, so this is a systematic literature review template inclu inclusion, exclusion. This is high precision, low sensitivity example. Only two keywords. This is low precision, high sensitivity example, which you'll get more literature. You can see from two items, I made it six items. But I never changed my exclusion criteria. So this is an example. You can have a look later and you can try out and see. Okay. Okay, I hope that is clear. Let's go to next one. And once you have decided the paper, once you are reading, use my literature review summary template to summarize the information. Okay, to summarize all the information uh, under this, these columns, title, authors, introduction, theory, variables, methodology, analysis, findings, potential gap. You can modify whichever information according to your own study because sometimes you don't have variables. Sometimes you won't have theory. Modify accordingly. And from there, finally, uh, you do your systematic matrix. Okay, which will include variable or subject focus. What is your subject focus? What is the independent variables, other variables, theoretical framework, method? You can also include critical review if you wish to. Okay, So all of this, you can find it here. You just search here, you can find all these templates. All right. Now, let's, next one, criteria for SLR writing. Okay. First of all, from what I've explained now, you must have a, once you, did, once you do all the, the search function, the filtration function, title EPSCI, full paper filtration, uh, snowballing, then quality assessment, then you'll be able to produce this protocol. This is called SLR protocol. Identification, screening, eligibility included. So you see the process here. This is how they eliminate, eliminate, eliminate. At the end, they have 87 papers. Okay, all right. This is the entire research flow. You can also have this diagram if you wish to. If uh, I'll be sending a TKM paper, Dr. Kashif's paper, I'll be sharing with you. In that paper, you can find this diagram. I'm giving you the best examples that you can follow if you wish to have. 
not necessarily you must have. I have, I have published my own papers without having this diagram, but it's good to have. I'm showing you best examples. So from research questions, this flow, this diagram explains what are the keywords, databases used, inclusion criteria, article selection criteria, refinement, data extraction, information extraction, finally, data synthesis. Okay. And of course, I've explained to you, this diagram is very important. And what kind of journals are being published in this topic? Why is this important? Because you want to show in this topic that I've reviewed, most of the papers are published in high impact journals, mostly web of science with impact factor. So it shows that all these research are not scam research. They are all very valid and strong research. That's what you want to show. You see all these journal names, you can extract this. I'll, I'll show you in the next class how to extract this information. Don't worry about that. Okay. All right. And um, if social demography is important for you, you can also show how your research is evolving across different countries, how frequently they publish papers for that particular countries. And then your variable or your themes or your um, uh, um, review criteria, whatever thing, the uh, theme that you're reviewing or particular uh, technology that you're reviewing, whatever it is that you're reviewing that certain keywords, you can also cross check that across different references to show how frequently they are being reviewed. Okay, across different years, you can see 2019, all the way to 1994, to show the relevancy. Okay, but this is not absolutely important. It is a good thing to have. It's like it's nice to have Ferrari, but not everyone can have same thing here. It's nice to have you can do if you want to extra work to make your paper more stronger. If you don't want it is still fine. Okay, but all these, this one all, no, not this, 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 this one all, this one all quite compulsory. Okay. All right. Next thing, journal versus thesis for systematic approach. Okay. Before I continue, any questions so far? Sorry if I'm going a bit fast because uh, the time is almost out there, almost, almost running out already. So uh, any questions, please let me know. Okay, none. All right. So next thing, um, let me move this. Um, SLR for thesis, key problems with Prisma. Okay. SLR for thesis, when you use Prisma, there are some issues you need to face. What are the issues? Problem number one, it is never designed for reviews that involve narrative, qualitative or mixed method. Originally more for quantity, the way the protocol was, the, the, the way the, uh, the um, methodology was designed. Problem number two, systematic mapping has emerged as a popular method for evidence synthesis. But Prisma cannot be easily adapted for these methods that rely more heavily on searching and screening. Problem number three, Prisma might not be suitable for later standards of researchers. Refer to paper titled Rose's Reporting Standards for Systematic Evidence Synthesis. I will share this paper with you. If you are interested to know more on systematic review, you can read this paper and understand why Prisma might not be suitable for thesis. People are doing, I'm not saying no, but they are finding it very hard. Okay, very hard. Next thing, what is the alternative? You can look at ROSES. ROSES was designed for environmental management research, but you can use it across the board. It's almost like scoping review. ROSES is almost equivalent to scoping review. Okay. Difference, ROSES is more on systematic maps and reviews, while Prisma focuses on reviews only. There is no mapping. Systematic mapping con combines the concept of scoping review as well. That means you get a lot of different uh, angle, a lot of different resources. Difference number two, different checklist, summary and flow diagram. See upcoming slide for Rose's flow. Difference number three, can include quality and narrative reviews. You can include anything you want. Okay. So this is Rose's flow. You see Rose's flow, records identified through database searching, through other sources. Then the, it is actually more process flow. Rose's is a bit more extensive. Uh, records uh, after duplicates removed, what are the number of duplicates? After title screening, what are the excluded titles? After abstract, what are excluded? After articles retrieved at full text, what were unretrievable? Articles after full text screening, what were the excluded full text with reasons? pre screen article from other sources, that means your snowballing method and so on. And articles included after full text screening. Okay, then we continue here. Then here, let me zoom in a bit. Studies included after critical appraisal, excluded studies with reasons. 
studies included in narrative synthesis, and finally studies included in quantitative, qualitative, and other synthesis. So this is where you include all other different kind of studies, and finally studies not included in further synthesis with reasons. Okay, so this is Rosas. Don't worry about it. I'll give you a paper to study more on it. Okay, if you have interest. Okay, when to write SLR papers? This is a summary of the papers that you can write from your thesis. Okay, so from here, you have proposal stage and you have thesis stage. Just to recap a bit. Huh? From proposal, you can write concept paper, you can write scoping review paper, and you can also write SLR paper. This one, you can write from step one itself. This one you can write at about step number five, I think. One, two, three, four. Step number four. Four and step number four from my diagram. Okay, from my diagram. Then this one is in the thesis phase in far corner. I think it's step number 10. After step number 10, you can write empirical paper and meta-analysis. Okay, step number uh, 10 also. Then you can write another scoping review paper. When do you write this? This one you write after Yba. If you have time before YY, you can write, but I would say don't overstress. Lah. Unless you are very good at writing paper, then it's okay. After YY, you can write another scoping review paper based on your future work. Why future work? Because future work, you're opening new avenue, new things that you haven't explored. All those can become new scoping review papers. Okay, This is a summary of the kind of papers that you can write from a thesis. So start early, start planning early. Don't wait until last minute. Don't. Because once you wait last minute, your paper gets rejected, not accepted, all these problems will start kicking in. How important is proofreading? Let's check the outcomes. General of Building Engineering, just now the example I showed you, just from last year, SCIQ1, Impact Factor 5.318. This is the transformation the general went through from us. This is all under paraphrasing, proofreading, editing, and structuring. You need this. If you want to write specially review papers on thesis and so on, if your language is already good, if your IELTS is already more than 7.5 individually or more than 8, that makes you almost an expert. You don't need proofreading. You can do it on your own. Grammarly is more than enough. If your level is less than 8 or 7.5 individually, okay, definitely Grammarly won't be enough. Okay, That is how I evaluate. That's how we have measured recently. Uh, recently okay? So, good content and bad language is equivalent to no one can understand or appreciate. So before Viva, if you never, if you have good content but bad language, this is what your examiner is going to feel. Okay. If you have bad content and good language, readers are happy because it's nice to read, but no value. So what I'm trying to tell you is you must have good content and good language as well. So readers appreciate the value and love to read. This is what you want to achieve ultimately. Okay, another very good paper for you to read. If you guys know Dr. Herold, this is Dr. Herold's paper. Okay, this is, I think, our uh, seventh or eighth of his paper. Okay, seventh or eighth. This was last year. So I think it was seventh. No, I think it was ninth. This year, we are already clocking 15th or 16th of his paper. All SLR paper were done by us. Okay, I mean, our paraphrasing part. So this is SCIQ1, Impact Factor 4.3. Why this particular paper? Because this paper is the guideline for developing a systematic literature review. So in case if you want to learn more, you can also read this paper. And this is the transformation this particular paper went through. Okay. General production tips. As I have seen above all top-notch papers from my esteemed clients, important points I always discuss with them. Don't assume your reader understands everything. Explain, be descriptive. Make sure the ideas are well structured in the paper. Avoid all over the place method. Okay. So polish and always polish. Get a solid editor to proofread. Uh, no problem, Mirza. Thank you very much. No problem. Go ahead. I understand. And if you're going to submit your thesis or journal, no matter where you proofread or you don't proofread, if you can, please get a certificate along with your submission. Because if they see non-Caucasian name from Asian countries, the first assumption, even before they see it, they will assume you never proofread. Okay? So it's one of their main filtration now, especially journals. So make sure you have the certificate, well-endorsed certificate. Okay? Another important thing I need to share today, only for invited classes, I still provide ultimate thesis package up to 30% off for students who attend the classes, proofreading, translation, and formatting services only. Okay, And we are the one and only language warranty provider. What is language warranty? That means 
if you do proofreading, paraphrasing, editing, structuring, if you submit to journal, if you submit to uh, YY and so on, examiner still complain language, uh, reviewer still complain language, we will redo it for free with warranty. Okay. So as long as you don't make any changes after our proofreading, if you make changes, warranty void. Okay. Right. And there is no time limit for this. And today's free notes will include developing and applying a protocol of systematic review in social sciences. Just now you saw the example, right? The database, how to explain uh, the database that comes from this article. Very, very, very important, especially for you guys. Rose's reporting standards. If you want to use systematic review for thesis, read this paper. You will understand better. And finally, a very good example to follow is this paper. So I will email all of you these three items with the slide. Make sure that you guys register yourself. Okay. Last but not least, I am going to design new classes on Facebook Live. I give you the opportunity to propose for what kind of classes you want. Very simple. Go to this particular, click this particular link. Um, one moment, let me share it. Okay. Click this particular link. Don't go away yet. Please wait. Click this link I've given in the chat box. Make sure you hit five star. Don't hit anything less than five star. Hit five star. In the chat box, please write down what future classes you want on Facebook Live. So I can do anything specific you can give. Because all the 115 classes were conducted based on the request of students. They will say, I have hard time doing qualitative. I have hard time doing quantitative. So when there is enough quorum, enough requests, I will create a new class free okay, on Facebook. So this is your opportunity to go and click that link hit five star and request for the class. If you're going to do less than five star, don't hit that link. You can ask via Telegram group. Okay. And this is where we are located. Proofreading by UK PhD in Cyberjaya. That's our address there. But we only meet students or academicians on appointment basis. Okay. All right. Finally, what to do if you are stuck, really don't know what to do and cannot go forward. These are the things that we normally do. Publication, content editing. This is examiner response. Proposal Defense Examiner Response, PhD Proposal Consultancy, Defense Viva Preparations, Thesis to General Conversion, Data Analysis Interpretation. All these are coaching. Eh? Coaching, not only for students, but professors as well. This is Professor Barakatun Nisa from UPM. So we cover across the board. Okay, finally, thank you very much. Sharp at 11.57, we are done. So that um, you guys can go ahead for your weekend and also Friday prayers. Okay, so thank you very much. Let me un, uh, unshare my screen and then I'll hand over back to uh, Miss Sarah. Thank you very much, guys. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, for your for our webinar today. And mm -hmm. we meet uh, our last webinar, right? No, there's one more left. Yeah, on, yeah. on December. Yeah, last one, yeah, betul. Okay, please do your, please speak in your attendance list. And for those who want to, the, uh, the, the notes, you can fill in this uh, link, I will give you. Can you reshare the attendance link, please? Uh, students are asking. Okay, right there. Thank you very much, guys. So, okay, I'll, I'll leave first. I wish you all the best and I have a very, very good weekend. Take care. And I've shared the review link again. Please click that link, review, and please share um, what you want me to teach in the next class. Lah. All right, okay. Thank you very much. See you guys. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dr.